I'm really thrilled about our next two speakers. Maribel Lopez is the founder of Lopez Research and the Data for Betterment Foundation. Lopez Research is a market research and strategy consulting firm covering topics that range from artificial intelligence to hybrid work transformation. Her clients range from startups to the Fortune 30. Maribel is a contributor to Forbes and a host of the podcasts Reimagine Hybrid Work, AI with Maribel Lopez, and Elevate the Edge. Maribel, welcome to Connect 2022. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. We've been talking all day about thriving under pressure. Here's someone who has truly lived it. It's my absolute pleasure to present one of the first women to compete in Formula One and the founder of Dare to be Different, Susie Wolf. career, a lot of it was about belief. That's ultimately our absolute goal. Wow. What an incredible career. Susie, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us at Connect today. I'm so looking forward to hearing this conversation on data, thriving under pressure, and truly winning at change. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you, Jamie. It's great to be part of the event. What a career from Formula One to Formula E at Rocket Venturi Formula E in your role as team principal. You brought a relatively unrecognized team to huge success with victories and podiums not seen before. Um, and in the interest of getting to know you a bit, can you talk a little bit about the transition from racing to senior management? Absolutely. I mean, I think winding the clock way back many people presume that i was a little girl with a huge amount of talent for racing um but actually motorsport was really in my blood because my parents met when my mum went to buy her first motorbike from my dad's shop in the west coast of scotland and they still run that same shop some 40 years later so i had a little motorbike as a young girl um, but my dad decided four wheels were safer than two so i got a go-kart for my eighth birthday and I think many people presume that, that I was a clear talent, um, but initially, you know, everyone out on track was, was much quicker than I was, and they were kind of bumping me as we were going past. And I remember distinctly coming back into the, the pits and saying to my dad, I really don't like it out there. Um, mm. that's, that's no problem, Toots. That was his nickname for me. He said, we've got two options now. We put the cart back in the truck and we drive home, or you go back out there, you try and go faster, and when they bump you, you're going to bump them back twice as hard. So I think you can all guess what option I went for. And that was really the start of the, the journey for me. And it was really only a hobby at that point. I raced in the Scottish Championships, then progressed to the British, then got qualified for the European. And it all really changed at the age of 13 because I was taken to watch a Formula 3 race. And for those of you 
who are quite into motorsport, you know, it's on the ladder to Formula One. And there was a young gentleman called Jensen Button that won the race that day. He went on to become a Formula One world champion. And that's really when the dream was born in my head. I love how you managed to pair the concept of resiliency with inspiration and how it went from uh, overcoming a challenge to having a vision for your future. And I'd love to spend a minute talking a bit more about the competing priorities you saw during that transition, as well as some of the challenges you may have faced. Well, when I decided to, to hang up my helmet, the decision was very easy because I was very clear that I didn't just want to be known as an ex-racing driver. I wanted to have a second career as a sports person. You always know um, that your career will end one day. And I wanted to be in the driving seat, excuse the pun, of, of when that was and, and how it would, um, let's say, from a timing perspective, happen. But actually, when I then was no longer a racing driver, I had some tough months because I'd lost my whole identity. I'd woken up every day with a clear purpose and a clear goal and suddenly I had a blank sheet of paper in front of me. And as much as I was exciting on the one hand, it was also quite daunting. You know, in what area would I kind of embark on my next challenge? But I'm someone that relies a lot on my, my gut feeling. My gut feeling said it wouldn't be motorsport because my husband by that time was a multiple world champion in Formula One. I didn't want to work for him for the sake of our relationship and marriage. But um, and I also felt I, I needed something different. And I didn't want to work for a competitor of Mercedes. So I was looking at fashion. I was looking at tech. I was looking at wellness. And then I got a call from a, a gentleman who I'd known throughout my career. And he said, come and run my Formula E team for me. And I was one of the cynics. I said, Formula E, that's never going to function. Electric racing cars and city centers. How wrong was I? Um, and of course, I went to visit a race and was really blown away by what they'd managed to achieve. I remember standing in the in Brooklyn, seeing that Statue of Liberty and, and then electric cars racing around. And then, of course, Dieselgate happened and the whole electrification of the automotive industry really sped up. And I embarked on, on what was a huge challenge initially because the team was at the back of the grid. Um, it wasn't successful. And it had, from a business case perspective, we, we were really struggling. Um, but I never once doubted that I could achieve a turnaround in the team. I said to my business partner, I need three years. There were obviously certain elements coming from being a racing driver that I had very little knowledge. And the first six months were spent restructuring the team, getting really good people on board. So that in those areas where I didn't have the experience or the expertise, I was able to empower those around me um, to do a very good job. And I think having such a passion for motorsport and having such an understanding of the industry and the business meant that even in the areas where there were maybe weaknesses, I was able very quickly um, to, to gain knowledge and, let's say, uh, make the right decisions for the, for the long-term success of the team. In a lot of ways, it's like any individual that goes into a new role. You spend a certain amount of time gathering data, trying to figure out what the issues and opportunities are, and that's exactly what you were doing. And as this is a data conference, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about data. How is data being used in racing? Because it's a really amazing use of data. To put it bluntly, I mean, everything in motorsport comes down to data now. Um, the sport has developed at such a rapid speed that literally when the cars are running on track, we have 800 sensors that are feeding us back information. With the development of the, the, the sport, we no longer have as much testing on track. We have built up very high-tech simulators. So put on top of that, all of this data from the racetrack when the car is actually running, coupled with all the data that you're creating in your simulator, and obviously you want to find correlation between the two, you're facing a, a, a huge task of having an enormous amount of data. And of course, it comes down to the human performance, being able to understand which data is important for performance, which data, data will bring the biggest performance, which brings the marginal gains that comes later down um, the line. And that really comes down to getting very experienced individuals. And teams have grown in size enormously um, since 10, 15 years ago. There's now 2,000 people um, in a Formula One team between the engine department and chassis department. And a huge part of them being able to do their jobs correctly is relying on the data. 
Um, but of course, on the business side, what I love about motorsport is the fact that it's, it's so pure. It all comes down to the numbers. You know, in some other industries and in creatives, everyone has an opinion. It can be quite subjective. In racing, it's black and white. If you're doing well, you're going to be successful on track. If you're not, you're not getting the results on track. So I think the purity of the sport, because it comes down to the results and the numbers, means that you're always able to know where you are and how successful you're doing. And if you're not being successful enough, you can dive deep into the data and figure out how can we make ourselves more successful. I find the use of data in racing fascinating because I think it gets to a problem that many organizations are struggling with, and that's large volumes of data. And I'm wondering if there's a framework you use to evaluate what to do next in the business. It's very difficult, and it's, and it's an ongoing challenge because as much as we rely on the data heavily to give us the direction, obviously the performance on track, we also can't afford to get lost in the data. And that's something that, as you can imagine, it's very easy to do because every element of the car with so many sensors is sending back readings, which in theory should tell us everything we need to know. What can be quite challenging for the engineers is that there's a racing driver sitting in the car, a human being with emotions that they're not able to control and it doesn't give them back consistent data. And quite often you can, you can find situations where the data all says that we should be quick, but the driver comes into the pits and says, I don't have confidence in the car. Under braking, it feels nervous or I can't turn in as I want. There's not enough front end grip. So those factors need to be taken into account. We can rely on the data, but we also need to understand that there is the human element. And of course, it also leads, like I mentioned before, into the challenge of finding the balance between using the data, but not getting lost into the, in the data. Uh, and I think that's where experience um, comes into play. And that's where I think the whole concept of the team really understanding that it's communication between the engineers and the trust between them and the data of making sure that they're taking the right decisions because small decisions can have huge impact on your performance in at the current moment, but also for the future. I want to dig in for just one second on this concept of trust because it's such a huge thing. And in any organization, I think there's this issue with trusting the data. And I would imagine in racing where you're in a car and you're trying to make real-time decisions and you're working with the data, there's certainly this tension around that. Um, has there been any way that you've thought of, you know, improving the different constituents' trust in the data? You know, you just talked about the actual driver being in there saying it doesn't feel right even though we're saying this. So is it just really thinking about, like, how we partner those two things together and then show over time how the data has been working in racing? Or what are your thoughts on trust in data? I think the big advantage is as much as the engineers have to rely on the driver being confident in the car and being able to deliver their performance because they, in the end, are the last line of attack and it's up to them to deliver the race performance. But in the same respect, I think the drivers also trust and rely on data. When I started racing um, in my early 20s, we would be lucky to have a speed trace and a throttle trace. Now every element is there for a driver to compare themselves against their teammate in terms of how much steering you're using, how much brake pressure you have. I mean, every small detail from the driver's input to the car brings up data, which allows them to then compare directly against their teammate, which they trust because that's where they can gain performance. In a qualifying session, it's quite often the first thing a driver will come into the pits and ask for, give me a compare against my teammate. Because even if the teammate isn't quicker, there will always be, if they're equally matched, one corner or one area of the track where they might be slightly quicker. And that's why it's a, it's a game of trying to get, put together all of these small marginal gains to get the ultimate performance. So I think driver and engineer have huge trust in the data, but they also understand that it comes down to the communication of, of discussions around what the data is saying and their agreement in that, that what the data is saying. And we have a situation this year, um, you know, Lewis Hamilton is probably one of the greatest of all time. Mercedes are eight time world champions and they build a car that's not quick enough and they're going to lose the championship this year. And that came down to a series of just small decisions that were taken in the build of the car and which direction to go middle of last year. And 
now you see, of course, there's a lot more, let's say, difficulty in the system and in the team because, well, the car's not quick enough. And that can bring huge pressure on the team. And that's where, in this situation, they need to keep the trust in each other. They need to keep the trust in what the data is telling them. Um, even if, of course, you start to get very, very frustrated that the results are not coming and you're not getting race wins. And my husband always says at, at the end of a, of a debrief call, let's not forget, it's not mystics, it's physics. We have got to trust the numbers and not lose ourselves because the pressure is mounting because the success is not there. You brought up an interesting comment, and that's the concept of pressure and failure. So how do you handle that pressure and how do you cope with failure? You know, many people say, you've got to make failure your friend. Failure will never be my friend because I hate failure. It gives me a sick feeling in the stomach. And in the end, if you're competitive or you're in an environment where you're judged on your performance on track, you've got to be competitive. And with competitiveness comes naturally pressure. And I always say the most pressure I have is for myself because I want to perform. But I think in terms of coping with failure, you know, in sport, there's only ever one winner. That means everyone else needs to cope with failure. And there's a great saying, second place where you're the first loser. So you really need to figure out how you do make failure manageable. For me, I always know that failure on the days that are the toughest for this team and, and for me in my role are the days that I definitely learn the most. They are the toughest to cope with emotionally, but I always make sure that out of a very difficult moment, I come away learning and making sure that I have enough resilience to come back with even more enthusiasm and motivation. In terms of coping with pressure, for us, having been obviously a racing driver for so long, there's there's three key areas that we really use to cope with pressure. And the first is preparation, making sure that there's no stone unturned in our preparation for success so that if you don't get the success, you can at least go to bed that night and say, well, I gave it all I had. And that has to be something which which gives you kind of inner inner peace. The second is not allowing your thoughts to drift on the outcome. Stay very focused in the present moment and not allowing yourself to think too much about the consequences of success um, or failure. And the third is obviously the more time you spend under pressure, the more you get used to it. It becomes part and parcel and, and normal. And actually you're able to then use the pressure as, as an extra tool to bring performance in the car. You're able to because you've learned to live with it, use it also in the right way to bring extra performance. There's one thing I bet our audience is curious about and wants to hear more about, and that's what's changed with data. So you've been in the field for some time, and I'm sure that many things have changed when we think about how you would have used data, say, in the beginning of your career and how you would use it today. So is there a way that you could characterize what it's like using data and what it might be like today versus the past? Definitely. I think, you know, even before my time in racing, the years of, of Senna, Prost, Mansell, there wasn't really any data. It was simply their feeling in the car and they relied on their natural instinct in a car and their feedback to the engineers because the engineers had no data that gave them the hard evidence of what was actually happening all on track. But obviously with the evolution of the sport, it got a lot more technical. And I think really the big transition came during the Schumacher era. He wasn't a driver that had a beer straight after the race or a cigarette before. He made sure that every element was to the highest spec. And that meant the, what happened on, in the car, but also off the car. And he got really down into data and the, the preparation. Um, that let's say big shift up in let's say professionalism from the driver then coincided with the fact that drivers weren't allowed to test as much and had to spend a lot more time in simulators which then led to there being a lot more possibilities for preparation and data creation um, before an event and and to give you an idea before we go to a Formula E event we will spend the minimum of 10 days in our simulator preparing two of those days are spent only looking at the optimum energy strategy for the race. Mm. Um, so that element of preparation is, is so important to the success. And that simply wasn't a part of racing um, previously. Um, 
obviously we spoke earlier, the cars now have incredible amounts of sensors on them, which is creating data. The data is now live, which means as the car is out on track, the exact data is showing up on the screens of the engineers. And there's an incredible story. Um, the Malaysian Grand Prix, I think around six or seven years ago, Lewis went out to start his last qualifying lap to try and get the pole position. As he was doing his warm-up lap before he started the flying lap, there was an error on his um, dash, which related to a, an engine malfunction. It was picked up by an engineer in Brackley, England, who was watching the data live. He managed to fix the problem, send the correct code to the engineer on the pit wall in Malaysia, who then relayed a different steering wheel setting because the drivers can change certain things on their steering wheel. Within six corners, they had fixed the car and he went on to take pole position. Now, that would just be unheard of even, I think, 12, 15 years ago because the data wasn't live. So if there was an issue, the car just would have stopped. But I think that shows how far we've come on technology and data and uh, how much we can, let's say, work towards consistency and also not having um, problems with the cars. The engineers have so much information from the car live as it's running, um, and that gives them a, a huge edge on performance. Your description really speaks to the nuances of dealing with people and data and pulling them together in ways that are inspiring. And I seem to recall that you also have the scenario where you don't use the same data forever. I believe you actually need to get rid of data on a certain cadence of years. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. For, for us, it's hugely challenging because every four years, we have a new set of technical regulations and sporting regulations, which means you need to build a brand new car from scratch. In Formula E, um, it's every four years. In Formula One, on the power unit side, it's six years. On the chassis side, also four years. And if you can imagine building a brand new car, that means that all of the data you have previously collected is obsolete. Those cars will never run again. So all of that data has no relevance to your future performance. And that really puts spotlight on how agile you are as an organization, how quickly you can define what are the key areas of the data which are going to bring big steps in performance. And that's so critical in the early months of a new regulation change because that can really set up the momentum for your whole um, period with, with the new car. And we had this situation in Formula E. There was a new generation of car. It's called the Gen 2. It was quite um, tricky initially because it had a break-by-wire system. The team that went on to win the, win the three next world championships was a team that were so quick to understand the new technology um, that that then gave them a head start. And as soon as they then won one championship, they got used to winning. And winning is something that becomes easier the more you do it. Um, but it's very challenging because, as you can imagine, when a new car hits the track, you really are starting from zero. And it's a huge race to define the areas that you can specifically identify as bringing performance because as we discussed earlier you can't afford to get lost in the bigger numbers because a new car will have so many new data points that you've really got to be very very precise in which areas you want to focus on. Susie I'd like to double click into something that I'm not quite sure the audience fully appreciates and that's racing moves very quickly but could you give some context to the audience of What's the speed at which you have to analyze data? As you can imagine, Mary Brill, it's, it's very, very um, time intensive. When we turn up at a race weekend, we'll go out for free practice one and we'll have a very clear um, run plan of what we want to test in the car. And then we'll only have 90 minutes to read and digest that data and come up with the changes we want to make for the second free practice session. And bearing in mind, we need to, get a car that's capable of winning a race over 70 laps. So it needs durability. It needs to have consistency. But at the same time, we need to find the right setup for a car, which is ultimately quick over one lap. So that means that after each session, that huge amount of data that's created, the race engineers at the track very quickly know which parts of the data they need to pick out in order to make very quick decisions to change the car for the following session. But that data is all then sent back 
to the factory in very high speed um, connections. So that it's nearly a real time for the team back at base to really dig through and come up with, let's say, the more fundamental questions and directions, which will be discussed at the end of the day. And quite often the data that gets sent back to the factory can only become relevant after the race weekend because it can't be digested and read quickly enough to have the correct influence in such a short space of time. And that's where it's so important that those based back at the factory are working one-on-one -on -one with the race team because we are restricted to how many people were allowed at a race. Only 70 people are allowed to be part of a race team at the track. As you can imagine, there's hundreds of engineers um, then back at base, focusing on each different area. Tires is a very specific area. Then the engine performance. Is there small changes to be made to the software to optimize the engine performance over the race distance on Sunday? So it's an incredible team effort of engineers working with the data to come up with the optimum strategy in the quest for success on track. What advice do you have for business leaders in our audience? It's resilience. For me, the biggest, most important part of my career from being a racing driver also into the role now of, of leading the team is having that resilience, never giving up. There are incredibly tough moments. We came from a team that was not performing to a team that nearly won the world championship. And believe me, there was very difficult moments along the way, but I never lost, lost sight of what I wanted to achieve. And I never allowed myself to not come with 100% of my effort and energy to the table. And just being the best version of myself, it's sometimes not enough, but as long as I give my best um, and bring a resilience into the team, um, then that's something which I think is, is for us the most important. Resilience is something that everyone can use, that's certain. And it's been very inspiring talking to you and about your use of data and about your career. Thank you so much for your time, Susie. It's a pleasure, Mary Bell. It was great to speak.